Good morning, Sir Imam and friends. Today we are from Group 2 and we are going to present about organizational culture. So first, what is organizational culture? Organizational culture is a system of shared meaning held by members that distinguishes the organization from other organizations. There are seven characteristics that seem to capture the essence of an organization's culture. First one is innovation and risk-taking. It is the degree to which employees are encouraged to be innovative and take risks. The second one is attention to detail. It is the degree to which employees are expected to exhibit precision, analysis, and attention to detail. The third one is outcome orientation. It is the degree to which management focuses on results or outcomes rather than on the techniques and processes used to achieve them. Fourth one is people orientation. It is the degree to which management decisions take into consideration the effect of outcomes on people within the organization. The fifth one is team orientation. It is the degree to which work activities are organized around themes rather than individuals. The sixth one is aggressiveness. It is the degree to which people are aggressive and competitive rather than easygoing. And the last one is stability. It is the degree to which organizational activities emphasize maintaining um, the status quo in constant in contrast to growth. Now, do organizations have uniform cultures? Organizational culture represents a perception the organization's members hold in common. Statements about organizational culture are valid only if individuals with different backgrounds or at different levels in the organization describe the culture in similar terms. The purchasing department can have a subculture that includes the core values of the dominant culture, such as aggressiveness, plus additional values unique to members of that department, such as risk-taking. So dominant culture is a culture that expresses the core values that are shared by a ma majority of the organization's members. Um, core values is the primary or dominant values that are accepted throughout the organization, while subcultures is the mini cultures um, within an organization, typically defined by department design agents and geographical separation. Strong versus weak cultures. It is possible to differentiate between the strong and weak cultures. If most employees have the same opinions about the organization's missions and values, then the culture is strong. Um, if opinions vary widely, um, then the culture is weak. So strong culture is a culture in which the core values are intensely held and widely shared. The stronger the culture and the greater the influence on member behavior. The reason is that a high degree of shared values and intensity create a climate of high behavior control. Next, we have culture versus formalization. We've seen in the text that high formalization creates predictability, orderliness, and consistency. A strong culture modifies behavior similarly. Therefore, we should view formalization and culture as two different roads to a common destination. The stronger an organization's culture, the less management needs to be concerned with developing formal rules and regulations to guide employee behavior. Next, we have the functions of culture. Culture defines the rule of the game. First, it has a boundary-defining role. It creates distinctions between organizations. Second, it conveys a sense of identity for organization members. Third, culture facilitates commitment to something larger than individual self-interest. Fourth, it enhances the stability of the social system. Culture is the social glue that helps hold the organization together by providing standards for what employees um, should say and do. And the fifth one, it is a sense-making and control mechanism that guides and shapes employees' attitudes and behavior. This last function is particular interest to all of us. Next, we have culture creates climate. What is organizational climate? It is the shared perceptions organizational members have about their organization and work environment. If you have worked with someone whose positive attitude inspired you to do your best, or with a lackluster team that drained your motivation, you've experienced the effect of this climate. Next, we have the ethical dimension of culture. First, what is the ethical work climate, or EWC? It is the shared concept of right and wrong behavior in the workplace that reflects the true values of organizations and shapes the ethical decisions making of its members. Researchers have developed Ethical Climate Theory, or ECT, and the Ethical Climate Index, or ECI, to categorize and measure the ethical dimensions of organizational culture. Of the nine ECT climate categories, 
five are most prevalent in organizations that are instrumental, caring, independence, law and code, and rules. Each explains the general mindset, expectations, and values of the managers and employees in relationship to their organizations. For instance, in an instrumental ethical climate, managers may frame their decision making around um, the assumption that employees are motivated by self-interest. In a caring climate, conversely, managers may operate under the expectation that their decisions will posit positively affect the greatest number of stakeholders. Ethical climates of independence rely on each individual's personal moral ideas to dictate his or her workplace behavior. Law and code climates require managers and employees to use an external standardized moral compass such as a professional code of conduct for norms, while rules climates tend to operate by internal standardized expectations from, perhaps, an organizational policy manual. Organizations often progress through different categories as they move through their business life cycle. This is culture and sustainability. This sustainability refers to practices that can be sustained over a long period of time because the tools or structures that support them are not damaged by the processes. Concepts of sustainable management have their origins in the environmental movement. So processes, processes that are in harmony with the natural environment are encouraged. Social sustainability practices adjust the way social systems are affected by an organization's actions over time, and in turn, how changing social systems may affect the organization. Next, we have culture and innovation. The most innovative companies are often characterized by their open, conventional, collaborative, vision-driven, and accelerating cultures. Startup firms often have innovative cultures by definition because they are usually small, agile, and focused on solving problems in order to survive and grow. Next, we have culture as an asset. As we have discussed, organizational culture can provide a positive ethical environment and foster innovation. Culture can also significantly contribute to an organization's bottom line in many ways. Um, one of the example, you can read it by yourself, you can stop the video, um, but in the end, this uh, nonprofit organization um, became Florida's top-ranked agency within four years um, because from a business perspective, it was a tremendous cost savings, but at the end of the day, um, it's about the families we serve. It was said by Benitez, and I believe it is their CEO. Next is culture and sustainability. There are some major factors that signal a negative organizational culture. The first one is institutionalization. It is a condition that occurs when an organization takes on a life of its own apart from any of its members and acquires immortally. Next is barriers to change. Culture is a liability when shared values don't agree with those that further the organization's effectiveness. This is most likely when an organization's environment is undergoing a rapid change and its entrenched culture may no longer be appropriate. Next is barriers to diversity. Hiring new employees who differ from the majority in race, age, gender, disability, or other characteristics creates a paradox. Next is strengthening dysfunctions. In general, we've discussed culture that cohere around a positive set of values and attitudes. This consensus can create powerful forward momentum. However, coherence around negativity and dysfunctional management systems in a corporation can produce downward forces that are equally powerful. And the last one is barriers to acquisitions and mergers. Historically, when management looked at acquisi acquisition or merger decisions, the key decision factors were potential financial advantage and product synergy. In recent years, cultural compatibility has become the primary concern. All things being equal, whether the acquisition work seems to have much to do with how well the two organizations of both become a liability to the whole new organization. Hello everyone, my name is Aisha and I will continue the presentation about creating and sustaining culture. So first and foremost, how does a culture begin? So an organization's customs, traditions, and general way of doing things are largely due to how it was enforced first. So this means that the founder is the ultimate source of an organization, organization's culture. Culture creation in itself can happen through hiring and keeping employees with the same vision and energy. 
indoctrination of employees in their way of thinking and feeling, and also the encouragement of employees to internalize beliefs, values, and assumptions. Okay, so now that a organization culture is set in place, practices are done to maintain it. So first, we have selection. Selection is the process of identifying and hiring individuals that will be able to perform successfully in the given culture or environment. Second, we have top management. So actions of the top management have major impact on the organization's culture through words and behavior. Like for example, if the top management establishes that risk taking isn't desirable or is desirable, it is very likely that uh, employees will follow suit as well. And another example would be how much freedom managers give to the employees, appropriate dress codes, and etc. And the third step of keeping a culture alive is socialization. Socialization is a process that uh, where employees adapt to the organization's culture. There are three stages to this. The first is the pre-arrival stage, where individual arrives with their own set of values, attitude, and expectations on work of work and the of the organization. Two, the encounter stage, which is the stage where individuals see what the company is really like and confront the possibility that their expectations and the reality may diverge. And three, the metamorphosis stage, uh, which is the stage where employees changes and adjust to the job, work group, and organization. So in summary, as we can also see from the table, organizational cultures form through firstly the founders values vision and philosophy then maintained through selection of employees or the selection criteria then it is maintained through th through rules and vision made by top management and then lastly through employee adaptation in the socialization process so the cultures of an organization could also be learned by employees in a number of forms. First one is stories, second is rituals, third is material symbols, and fourth is language. And I will explain it further in the next slides. Stories circulate through many organizations, anchoring the present in the past and legitimating current practices. It can be in a form of narratives about the organization's founders, rule-breaking, wrecks to riches, successes, workforce reductions, relocations of employees, reactions to past mistakes, and organizational coping. It can also be tell when employees tell each other how they came to either fit or not fit with the organization or their first days of the job, including their early interactions with others and first impressions of organizational life. Another simple example is when Nike tell their employees about the Oregon running star Steve Prefontaine's battles to make running a professional sport and attain better performance equipment. They learn about Nike's commitment on helping others and helping athletes by that story. As rituals, which is the repetitive sequences of activities that express and reinforce the key values of the organization, which goals are more important, which people are important, and which are expandable. The practical example of rituals include the marketing firm United Entertainment Group that have unusual working hours. They do this because it supports a culture of creativity. The CEO, Jared Moses, said that you, when you mess with somebody's internal clock, some interesting ideas will come out. It is an example on how a company teaches their employees the culture. Symbols is what conveys to employees who is important, the degree of egalitarianism top management desires, and the kinds of behaviors that are appropriate. For example, is the building of Texas Electricity Company called Dinergy that have few individual offices, even for senior executives. The building is basically made up of cubicles, common areas, and meeting rooms. They do this as a simple that they value openness, equality, creativity, and flexibility. Next, but not least, is the language, which is unique terms describe equipment, 
officers, key individuals, suppliers, customers, or products that relate to the business. To create an ethical culture within the organization, manager can try following principle. First, be a, mod be a visible role model. Employees will seek to senior management for guidance on how to behave ethically. But anybody can be a role model and help to improve the ethical climate. The second one is to communicate ethical expectations. When you're in a position of leadership, provide a code of ethics that outlines the organization's core principles as well as the judgment guidelines that workers must follow. And next is to provide ethical training. Set up seminars, workshops, and training programs to reaffirm the organization's norms behavior and define what, what actions are acceptable and handle any ethical difficulties that may arise. Next is to visibly reward ethical acts and punish the, the unethical ones. You should assess how subordinate decisions stack up against, against the company's ethical standards. It, we should examine both the methods and the ends. Those who act ethically should be visibly rewarded, while those who do, who do not should be visibly punished. And the last one is to provide protective mechanisms. We should seek institutional systems that will allow everyone to debate ethical concerns and report unethical behavior without fear. Many studies have shown that top management values are a good predictor of ethical behavior among employees. According to one study involving auditors, perceived pressure from organizational leaders to participate in unethical behavior was connected with increased intention to engage in unethical practices. Clearly, the improper kind of business culture may have a negative effect on employee ethical behavior. Finally, employees whose ethical values are similar to those who of their department are more likely to be promoted, implying that ethical culture may also be viewed as flowing from the bottom up. Okay, first of all, when given the word spirituality, the first thing that might came into our mind is might be something that has to do with God or theology. But in this context, workplace spirituality is not about an organized religious practices. Rather, workplace spirituality in this context, it means that it recognizes that people have an inner life that nourishes and is nourished by meaningful work in the context of community. So, what are the characteristics of a spiritual organization? The first one is benevolence. Where a spiritual organization, they always value kindness towards others and the happiness of their employees and other organizational stakeholders. And the second one is strong sense of purpose. Where a spiritual organization, they built their cultures around for a meaningful purpose. And for this case, although profits are important for a company's sustainability, they are not the primary value for this type of organization. And then the third one is trust and respect, where a spiritual organization are characterized by mutual trust, honesty, and openness, where employees are treated with esteem, value, and consistent with the dignity of each individual. And then the last one is open-mindedness, where as spiritual organizations, they always follow flexible thinking and creativity among their employees. So now after we discuss the concept of workplace spirituality, how do we actually able to achieve it in an organization? So there are actually several practices that can be implemented to facilitate a spiritual workplace, and some of them are supporting a work and life balance. So in this case, leaders can demonstrate values, attitudes, and behaviors that triggers intrinsic motivation and a sense of fulfilling through work. And then the second one is to always encourage employees to consider how their work actually provides a sense of purpose for other people. And this is often done through group counseling and organizational development. And then the last one is the company can offer employees some counseling services. <laughs> 